All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Samir Kalra, Managing Director of the Hindu American Foundation, join us to discuss Islamists in America, from Judeophobia to Hindu phobia. Mr. Kalra will speak for 10 to 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion to Mr. Samir Kalra. Great, thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, thank you for the Middle East Forum for hosting me today. And good afternoon, and thank you to all of you for being here uh, for this increasingly important and concerning topic that I wanted to touch on today. Um, so I'm going to first start out by giving a little bit of background about some of the Islamist groups and influence of Islamism in South Asia in particular, um, with a focus on one particular group, Jamaat the Islami. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of their activities here in the US and how that's ramped up in the last year with the focus changing or shifting more towards uh, India and Hindus. Um, and then talk a little bit about what the implications have been in terms of foreign policy and what the dangers are to a larger American society and what can be some of the next steps that we can take to confront uh, this growing threat. Uh, so with that, um, you know, I just want to begin by stating, you know, the Hindu American Foundation, one of our core areas of work that we're focused on is uh, human rights, uh, documenting, uh, raising awareness, and advocating for the human rights of Hindus and other minorities throughout South Asia. Um, and as part of that, a lot of the work that we've done and been forced to do is track the activities of Islamist groups, particularly in Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, and India, and particularly certain parts of India, such as the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and you know, what we've seen here is that um, wherever there is terrorist activities, um, you can see the hand of, even if it's direct, whether it's direct or indirect, of some of these larger Islamist groups, um, whether it is just outright violence or whether it's just providing political, ideological, or logistical support. A lot of these um, uh, incidences and a lot of the issues and conflict in South Asia, um, you can see the, uh, the hand of Islamists behind that. So I just want to talk a little bit about one particular group, uh, Jamaat the Islami, which is one of the most powerful, widespread and influential groups in South Asia, as well as here in the US in Islamist circles. Uh, Jamaat the Islami was founded in undivided India in 1941 by Islamic cleric named Mulana Abdul Al Madudi. And Jamaat drew its inspiration originally from the Deobandi School of Islam, which is based in the state of Uttar Pradesh in modern day India. This school has been known for um, some of its extremist interpretations of Islam and also for providing an ideological support to many of the terrorist groups. So a lot of the terrorist groups that you see active in the region, such as Lashkar Taiba, Hijbul Mujahideen, and many others have been influenced and drawn inspiration from this Deobandi School of Islam. Um, and this has, uh, this school has promoted religious extremism um, more broadly in throughout the region, whether it's Pakistan, Bangladesh, or India. Now, in terms of Jamaat the Islami, um, of course, it was established originally in undivided India, but after the partition of India in 1947, and then subsequently after Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan in 1971, independent branches were formed in these countries as well. So it is active in all major countries in South Asia at this time. Now, in the case of Bangladesh, Jamaat -e Islami has been much more overt and explicit in terms of its violence and its violent activities. For instance, during that same war in 1971 of independence, Jamaat the Islami, in conjunction with what was then the West Pakistani military, was responsible for committing horrific war crimes against the ethnic Bengali population that wanted more rights and eventually independence in Bangladesh, as well as a particular focus on the Hindu population there. Um, they blamed a lot of the secessionist feelings in Bangladesh because of its ties to its Hindu community, uh, which was quite significant at the time, and the Hindu community's influence in language, arts, um, and many other parts of uh, Bengali society. So Jamaat Islami was uh, had militias that were formed and that worked with the Pakistani army in order to commit um, systematic killings, rapes, torture, uh, both the Bengali opposition, intellectuals, as well as the Hindu population. If you fast forward into the post-independence era in Bangladesh, you see Jamaat-e-Islami continuing to play a role both in politics as well as 
what you would say is street violence. Um, in a lot of places, they were the ones responsible for many anti-Hindu and anti-minority riots, uh, whether it was during election time or otherwise. They also formed an alliance with uh, the opposition of Bangladesh Nationalist Party in Bangladesh and attained power in the 1990s for a short period of time. So even when they're not in power, they have wielded tremendous influence and disproportionate influence to their actual size. They are very financially um, well-to-do. Um, they have um, assets um, you know, in many countries across the world. Um, they control kind of these informal banking networks um, through the region. Um, they also get a lot of money from Saudi Arabia, um, the Middle East, oil money as well. And um, they continue to be a force in Bangladesh today um, and continue to commit acts of violence. Now, if you look at Jamaat Islami in places like Pakistan and uh, India, they are uh, less overt in their acts of violence, but nonetheless, they are still a very um, significant force. So in the Indian uh, Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir, which is formerly the state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, they um, have close ties to a terrorist group called Hezbollah Mujahideen, which is a U.S. State Department foreign terrorist designated organization. And so they have provided the recruiting base, um, the ideological base, and the political base for groups like Hezbollah Mujahideen and other terrorist networks. In Pakistan, similarly, they provided recruiting bases for Lashkar e Taiba. Um, they uh, control a number of madrasas. And again, they wield a tremendous influence in politics and general Pakistani society. So whether they're committing acts of violence, whether they're supporting terrorist groups, Jamaat the Islami and other Islamist groups are a important force to be reckoned with because more importantly, the ideological, political and recruitment bases that they provide to other transnational terrorist groups in the region. Um, now, Jamaat the Islami um, has been obviously active in South Asia for a number of years, but it's also been very active here in the U.S. So Jamaat has established chapters here in the U.S. and has, a, has had a presence here for a number of years uh, for, in areas particularly uh, such as Queens, New York. So there are some that were accused of committing war crimes during the 1971 war in Bangladesh that have actually fled and sought refuge here in the U.S. and continue to form organizations here in the U.S. and be very active. Uh, they are very powerful in terms of uh, their influence here uh, within the Muslim community as well as outside the Muslim community. They formed a number of affiliate organizations as well as connected with other Islamist organizations and have also utilize very high powered lobbying firms to both defend them as well as to influence policy regards to Bangladesh, for instance. Um, and what we've seen in recent years in terms of their activities has been how they have really helped to influence the narrative in the media as well as in places like local state and federal governments towards India and particularly towards Hindus. Um, and by that, I mean, they've taken up issues that are happening in India, political issues that are happening in India. They brought it here to the U.S. and then been able to effectively create propaganda narratives around it. They've been able to effectively advocate through resolutions, through hearings and through other means against um, against India and um, and which has gone into um, anti Hindu rhetoric as well. So some examples would be um, uh, the abrogation of Article 370 in India's uh, uh, former state of Jammu and Kashmir. So on, on August 5th, 2019, the central Indian government abrogated an article to the constitution, Article 370, which helped to further integrate uh, the state of Jammu and Kashmir into the Indian Union, and also made sure that all of India's laws applied equally to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So previously, Jammu and Kashmir um, was able to enjoy almost disproportionate autonomy to any other state um, in India. But as a result, what happened was that the power was in the hands of a few corrupt political families in the state. There was no development. Um, certain groups were discriminated against. Certain laws that were in place across India, such as um, you know, uh, discrimination protection laws against the lower caste or disadvantaged communities were not uh, in place in Kashmir. Similarly, laws that protected um, yeah, same-sex couples and uh, homosexuality did not apply in Kashmir either. So this was an attempt to further integrate the state into Jammu and Kashmir, into sorry the Indian Union, and also ensure the application of laws of India to the state. But what these groups here, these Islamist groups led by Jamaat-e-Islami um, 
affiliate groups did was they created a counter narrative that basically said that India was coming in and occupying Kashmir. Um, uh, India was coming in and stamping out the rights of Muslims in Kashmir um, and was whitewashing over activities and incidents that had happened there. Now, for instance, in 1989 to 1991, there was an ethnic cleansing of approximately 350,000 Hindus from the Kashmir Valley in the state of Jammu and Kashmir that were driven out. Um, but according to the narrative of these groups, these Islamist groups here, these people didn't exist or this ethnic cleansing didn't exist. These people left of their own free will or have become an insignificant issue within the larger discussion around Kashmir. Now, mind you, there can always be criticisms of Indian government policies, um, which are fair, um, such as some of the uh, shutdowns of communications, after the abrogation of Article uh, 370, which are legitimate uh, criticism. But in the narrative of the Islamist groups, they basically went to the extent of demonizing the Indian state, demonizing Hindus as the aggressors, when in fact in Kashmir, they had been the victims. Um, and they created a whole counter narrative around that. They did this in the, in the media. They did this in hearings uh, last year. Foreign Affairs Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee had hearings on Kashmir. And uh, a lot of these Islamist groups were helped uh, were behind the scenes helping to promote these hearings and helping to promote the witnesses that were invited to these hearings. And so the voices of the actually people that had been on the ground or that were minority voices were ignored and the voices that were championing the cause of Islamists were um, heard in, in, in the halls of these hearings. These groups have also um, whitewashed the terrorist activities of um, major terrorist groups in Kashmir currently. There was, a, there was a high level commander of Hezbollah Mujahideen, Riaz Naiku, who was killed by Indian government security forces last year. But instead of recognizing him as a leader of one of the major terrorist groups, they instead said that they gave this as an example of the Indian state coming down on an innocent Kashmiri boy. Um, and so again, this is another example of their activities. Now, while the focus has been on jamaat e islami um, and their affiliates, um, there have been new groups and there have been other groups, um, Islamist groups that have shifted their focus. So an example would be CARE, the uh, Council on American Islamic Relations, which has been a longtime Islamist group in here in the US and has traditionally focused on issues in the Middle East, uh, on Israel, um, which has veered into anti-Semitism. CARE has now become a major player in a lot of the issues um, dealing with India, um, has provided their logistical support and their manpower, their media savvy and their voice to a lot of these issues. Um, there's another new group that has popped up called Stand with Kashmir. Now the origins of this group are unclear and who is behind this group is unclear, but they have also become a major spokesperson uh, for a spokes organization for this uh, for these issues dealing with India. Um, and of course, jamaat e islami affiliate groups such as Islamic Circle of North America, Islamic Society of North America have also played very prominent, uh, prominent roles along with another group called the Indian American Muslim Council. Um, now, they have not just taken the fight at the federal level, but they have gone down to the local and state level. Uh, so for instance, since August 5th of last year, uh, they have gone to the local city councils and have um, uh, pushed a lot of anti-India resolutions. Now these have been both about Kashmir, but also about another issue that popped up last year, which was the Citizenship Amendment Act, which was a humanitarian and human rights bill that was passed by the Indian government to provide refuge and fast track citizenship to religious minorities, whether Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, um, Buddhist, Jain, uh, from countries as Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan that had specifically uh, uh, been subjected to religious persecution and helping them give them fast track citizenship within India because they had been languishing in refugee camps in India without legal status and without any real means to um, economically integrate into the country and been living on the margins of society. So it was a bill really um, specifically targeted to a specific issue and a specific problem. But these groups turned it into something that was an anti-Muslim bill. They created a hysteria that this was going to take away the rights of 200 plus million Muslim citizens when it had no impact on the actual rights of Indian Muslim citizens. It also started to conflate it um, with other issues and tried to say that this was going to then um, make more than 200 million Muslims stateless. 
Um, and this was the propaganda that made its way here into resolutions um, at the local city council level. We've seen them in San Francisco, in Chicago, in Albany, New York, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, other, and many other parts of the country. And the way they describe the issues in India are that Hindus are always the aggressor, that Muslims are not capable of um, doing anything wrong. They whitewash terrorist activities or terrorist groups, whether in Kashmir or in other parts of the region. They minimize the human rights suffering of Hindu minorities in countries such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan, where there is uh, documented evidence of these incidents happening. They also um, turn this narrative into riots that are happening within India into one-way pogroms. Um, an example for that would be uh, there were riots that came up in Delhi towards the end of last year uh, against uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act. And this involved violence by both Hindus and Muslims and where both communities were killed and affected by it. property was destroyed on both sides. But what these Islamist groups have successfully done is turn these into uh, describing them as one-way programs where Hindus only killed Muslims and Muslims were always the victims. And this is, fits into the larger narrative that they're trying to create here is that uh, Hindus are the oppressors and Muslims are the, uh, the victims and it's black and white. There's no middle ground. There's no actual discussion of some of these policies and issues. That's what they're promoting. That's what they're promoting the media. That's what they're promoting in these resolutions. And that's what they're promoting in their advocacy and lobbying um, on a more uh, larger scale. Now, why is this important? This is important because we're seeing this having an impact on the Hindu American community here. Um, you know, it's trickling down to their daily lives where Hindus have been harassed because of the propaganda. There was a Hindu in LA that was harassed uh, while in an Uber. Um, because the Uber driver was buying into the propaganda that these Islamists were pushing. Uh, we see Hindus in their local cities and um, uh, locales, you know, being questioned about what Hinduism stands for and what they stand for as a community by their interfaith communities, by their elected leaders. So it's having an impact here on Hindus at a local level, but it's also important because what we're seeing is really a gaining in prominence and effectiveness of these groups. Before it was Israel and anti-Semitic activities. Today it's India and anti-Hindu activities. Tomorrow we don't know who the new target is going to be. And it has a real opportunity to impact US-India relations when we're at a time now where we need India more than ever with China becoming increasingly aggressive and India really being one of the only counterweights to China in the region. Uh, we, see it, we, we see it at a time when it is affecting how relations are playing out between Pakistan and the US or China and Pakistan. And so these Islamists are really undermining the relationship with India and that's their real goal is their attempt is to undermine us india relations. So in terms of what we're trying to do as a foundation is to raise awareness and I know the Middle East Forum has done a lot of this work as well. We're trying to awareness about who these groups are, what their ulterior motives are and what they're trying to accomplish and then countering them at all of these levels, um, countering them in the media, countering them at the uh, local and city council level, uh, local city council level, countering them in Congress and other places, and really unmasking who they are. Uh, because if we don't, the, uh, they're gonna gain more and more power, and I think they're going to effectively um, affect, impact in a negative way US policy in South Asia. Um, and U.S. policy in South Asia, we've seen it playing an important role in the past, but now we see China meddling in the region even more. And so it's increasingly important that the U.S. keeps India as an important ally and a partner. And our policymakers here are educated on these issues so we don't do further damage to that relationship. And we maintain our strong partnership with the only democratic ally in the region, a secular democratic ally in the region, which is India. Um, and I think with that, um, I'll pass it back to Stacy for any questions that we have. All right, thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in. First one is, beyond its alleged anti-Hindu campaign, are there any indications that Jamadi Islami is active in US domestic politics or supportive of any particular causes or candidates for public office? Sure, so that's a great question. Um, so they seem to have found more sympathy with the Democratic Party. Um, and so you can see them, you know, these groups, and I would say more broadly even behind Jamaat, beyond Jamaat the Islami, some of these groups uh, supporting candidates like um, Ilhan Omar, um, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Pramila Jaipal, actually, who is by birth or avowedly a Hindu, but has actually been one of the leaders in a lot of these issues because she, in her political philosophy and ideology, is a Marxist. 
Um, and so she has gotten support from them and she's worked very closely with them. So it seems like a lot of these Dem Democratic uh, Party candidates at this point at least have gotten more of a um, connection with them. Um, and so I'm not sure about what domestic politics or domestic issues that they're pushing on, but I do know that these are some of the um, political candidates and elected officials that they are working with. Wonderful, thank you. So Hindus in America are typically economically and professionally very high up. Uh, how come Hindus are, or, whoa, <laughs> Hindus are politically weak in the US comparatively? Sure, so that's a good question. I think um, part of the reason for that is that it's a relatively newer community. Um, and, you know, majority of the Hindus that are here now, um, and the population is estimated about 3.2 million, and that includes non-Indian Hindus as well. But the majority, of course, are from India, and it came during the 1960s when the immigration laws were relaxed. And so as a newer community, the initial focus was on um, assimilation, um, economic su success, and making sure you're creating a good life for your kids, and advocacy and politics kind of became an afterthought. I think you do see now an awakening to an extent within the community because the community feels like they're being attacked and they feel like they're being on the defensive and they feel that they're being uh, framed in this manner by many of these Islamist groups and their allies. You do see more groups becoming active now um, at both at the grassroots level as well as in Washington, D.C. But I think it's a natural uh, progression of any immigrant community um, and where they are in, in, at this point in America. And you will see, I think, a lot more activism by them going forward. But yes, they have been traditionally weaker and not as organized because they haven't really put, haven't invested or they haven't put enough emphasis into these areas. Thank you. So we have a question in more about the background of all of this. How did pre-independence India manage to remain dominantly Hindu when the Muslim invasion for the most part killed Hinduism everywhere else on the invasion routes of Asia? Sure. So that's a great question. Um, and it's a very long answer, but um, I think, you know, part of, and that's, you know, that's an interesting point because India is one of the only places that has seen the continuous civilization from the pre-Islamic area era to the post-Islamic era, where you see a lot of the traditions um, surviving. Um, now, with that being said, we have lost a lot in countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, but the core is still there. Um, and I think that is part of it is the basis of Hinduism, which is diffuse and is not necessarily based around a central authority that you can attack a central authority, undermine it, and therefore destroy the roots of the civilization or the the culture or the religion, because it is a diverse religion, although there are obviously central um, underpinning themes and uh, concepts that unite it, it is somewhat diffuse. So my practice of Hinduism can be very different than my neighbors or even within my own family. And so when you have a diversity like that and you have a diffusion, um, it's very difficult to find a way to completely destroy it because it's going to keep evolving. It's going to keep popping up in different ways in different parts of the country. Um, and also, you know, it's not talked about, there was a great deal of resistance also um, by Hindu uh, kings, by the Hindu masses, and many others that resisted in different ways over the time, and actually, to some extent, influenced Islam that was in the subcontinent and, um, you know, softened it to, to an extent and made it take on a South Asian um, a flavor, if you will. Thank you. How large is membership in Jamaati Islami in the U.S.? Is it mainly expat? Bangladeshis or does it include Arab Islamists and have there been any actual acts of terrorism committed here against Hindus or others? Sure that's a great question so I don't know um, the actual membership uh, breakdown but from what I understand Jamaat Islami and its affiliates such as ICNA have a primarily South Asian um, uh, makeup to it and that can now I think there you see a lot more melding whereas maybe initially there were uh, more so uh, Bangladeshis, but now you see, I think, a mixture. Um, of course, in certain areas, the concentration may be different, but if you take a Jamaat is, um, affiliate such as ICNA or the Islamic Circle of North America, you'll see a more composite uh, makeup, um, which would be primarily South Asian, but it won't be just a Bangladeshi, it won't be just Pakistani, it won't be just Indian. You'll see kind of um, a, a mixture of those. Um, I don't know about the Arab composition, but they definitely do maintain strong ties with some of the more um, Arab Islamist organizations such as CARE, um, and that's been really coming out in the last couple of years. 
um, and of course, I'm sure with other um, Muslim Brotherhood affiliates. And now they, the interesting thing is you see on um, a, a kind of a convergence, not just on India issues, but these groups have also spoken out on against Israel. They've been involved in BDS uh, movements. They've signed on, they have people from their organizations that have signed on to like BDS initiatives here in the US as well. In terms of acts of terrorism, there haven't been any actual acts of terrorism here. Um, but I think what they do continue to do is provide a justification and they provide a, um, a safety net, if, as, if you will, for, you know, uh, the terrorist, um, terrorists in South Asia and also the understanding of terrorism and the mentality that terrorism is justified um, in that region. Understood. So this is the flip side of the title of your webinar. How does one expose the Islamist nexus without being accused of Islamophobia? Sure, that's a great question. Um, it's a challenge. Um, I will be very, um, you know, honest about that. Um, and you know, anytime we try to criticize the activities of, of Islamists and terrorists, we try to clearly distinguish between Islam and Muslims, and Islamists as a political, religious, social ideology, and a dangerous one at that. And so we're not talking when we say about these issues about Islam or about normal everyday Muslim. We're talking about the political ideology um, that has taken root and that has, um, you know, that is dangerous. Now, of course, even with that, even when we, you know, talk about human rights in some of these Muslim majority countries, you'll still be accused of Islamophobia. But I think it's very important to always draw that distinguishing line that we're not talking about Islam. We're not talking about Muslims as a people. We're talking about Islamists as um, uh, you know, as this political ideology and as um, a people that are, you know, through their own words are trying to create theocratic states with no room for minorities and no room for freedom of expression or any other rights or ideals that we hold sacred here in the US. So that distinguishing point, I think is always important to emphasize. Thank you. We believe that too at the Middle East Forum. Uh, so our last question of the day is, how are Hindus treated today in Pakistan and Bangladesh? And how does India treat its large Muslim population? Sure. So in both Pakistan and Bangladesh, you've seen a drastic demographic decline in the population of Hindus. Uh, so at the time of partition in 1947, what is now uh, Pakistan at that time was West, the Western wing of Pakistan. There are about 14 or 15 percent of the population were Hindus. That number now is 2 percent or lower. Uh, similarly, in Bangladesh, you had a population that was in somewhere hovering in the 20s, and that is now estimated at 9 percent or less, uh, depending on which estimates uh, you look at. But there's been, number one, a drastic demographic decline because of uh, persecution. Uh, forcing a lot of Hindus from both countries to flee the country into India and seek refuge there. Um, in Pakistan, you see, I mean, really on a uh, weekly, if not daily basis, reports of kidnappings and forced conversions and forced marriages of young underage Hindu girls. Um, this is also an issue that's affecting Christians um, significantly. There's a, there are many reports by human rights groups that say an average of a thousand um, Hindus and uh, Christian girls are kidnapped, converted, and forcibly married to Muslim men um, annually in Pakistan. And that's just what's reported. Of course, much of what happens is not reported. Um, Hindu temples are often targeted and attacked um, by both Islamists um, and sometimes by, um, you know, uh, by the government in terms of illegally occupying government, uh, sorry, temple land. Um, you know, selling government, uh, sorry, temple land to uh, private developers and kicking out Hindus from there. Um, you see Hindus and Christians subjected to bonded labor in Pakistan. Um, they are economically and politically marginalized. Um, you often see riots popping up whenever there's accusations of blasphemy against Hindus and Christians. So a lot of the incidences of uh, violence and persecution we see happening against other communities in Pakistan impacts Hindus as well. Um, similarly, in Bangladesh, um, Hindus have borne the brunt of um, riots there and large-scale violence anytime there are reports of blasphemy or anything else happening. Um, Hindu girls are also um, kidnapped and converted in Bangladesh and oftentimes uh, forcibly married. Um, Hindu land is frequently seized and occupied by Muslims, um, by Islamists, sorry, and Islamist groups in Bangladesh. Um, and the government often allows it to happen. Um, and so in both places, you see either the government and the state 
actively, um, uh, you know, uh, participating in uh, discrimination or being indirectly involved by allowing things to happen, not providing enough security, for not um, per prosecuting those that are responsible for violence. Um, and so that is uh, systematic in those countries. In India, of course, there are incidents um, of violence against Muslims. Um, um, and, you know, I won't say that there is nothing that happens there, but by and large, you will see uh, Muslims having many more rights in India. So for instance, in India, Muslims have their own set of personal laws. So while, while India is a secular country, Muslims can practice their own personal laws, marriage, divorce, inheritance, property rights, according to their own Islamic laws. Um, they also have um, a lot of accom rel religious accommodations and economic accommodations. They um, are uh, the beneficiaries of large um, government grants, um, government quotas in uh, positions, in government positions and you know, public institutions. Um, there has also been a demographic actually shift where the Muslim community has increased uh, significantly in India over the years. Um, and so, well, there are sporadic incidents, of course, um, and there have been incidents that have happened against Muslims, which are condemnable. Uh, don't get me wrong, we should speak out anytime those happens, but by and large, Muslims have many more rights in India than Hindu minorities or any minorities have in their neighboring countries. Understood. And real quick before we sign off for the day, can you just tell us where we can find some more information on your work? Absolutely. So please do visit us at HinduAmerican.org. Uh, that's our website where you can learn more about some of our projects around these issues. If you go to our human rights page and policy page in particular, you can learn more about some of these issues um, and follow us on social media at Hindu American. All right, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar today. Thank you again, Mr. Kara, for speaking with us. Thank you so on much. On Wednesday, please join us, <laughs> of course. Uh, for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our weekly update with Ashley Perry and again on Friday for Alain Berman's webinar, China Disrupts the Middle East. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.